The crowds came in record numbers and filled stadiums across the nation. They came with great expectations and were not to be disappointed. For this was the beginning of a new decade, new rivalries, the first year of the merger between AFL and NFL. But above all, it was professional football, the sport with a flash, dash, and thrills custom made for the new America, the now America. In 1970, pro football had grown so big that it bubbled over to weeknight contests. Sellouts, every one. In 1970, more people watched pro football than ever before. And many of them will long remember that this was the year the game renewed itself. The year when all the elements of excitement came together in perfect amounts to make 1970 that one vintage year. I love a challenge, and uh, if anyone can bring it out of me, then Terry Henry he can't. He's a top-notch quarterback. I feel right now that I'm the number one quarterback for Steelers. I don't think there is a number one quarterback. In Pittsburgh, the rivalry between the Terrys, Bradshaw and Hanratty, was a friendly one. But it was rookie Terry Bradshaw who opened the season at quarterback, and he found it tougher than it looked. On the bench, he gained experience as Terry Hanratty took over. But in the end, they alternated, the friendly rivalry unsettled. And in the end, the Steelers were the real winner. A less friendly rivalry in the AFC Central was between Blanton Collier's Browns and Paul Brown's Bengals. The Browns were favored to win the title, and in the early going, they looked good. Their win over the Bengals came as no surprise. But the Browns had breakdowns. They weren't nearly as strong as everyone had thought. And before long, people were looking toward Cincinnati where strange things were on the loose. The Bengals had lost six of their first seven and were considered out of the title picture. But suddenly they regrouped and began to devastate everything in sight. They avenged their earlier loss to Cleveland and before they were finished, the Bengals had won their last seven in a row while becoming the first expansion team to win a division title. So while Cleveland ended the season in mud and misery, the Bengals carried coach Paul Brown into the playoffs. In Green Bay, they used to see a lot of defense, and they saw a lot in 1970. But it came from the wrong people. For Bart Starr and the pack, it appears there will be no coming back. Not for a while, anyway. In Chicago, the Bears had a kickoff return man named Cecil Turner, who tied a record by running four kickoffs back for touchdowns. The Bears also had Dick Gordon, and he led the NFC in receiving. But above all, the Bears had Mr. Defense. 
Dick Butkus. And despite all that, the Bears lacked one thing, and that was a winning record. In Detroit, the Lions showed good balance, but defense was their key to victory. And defense got them 10 wins. Although 10 victories was enough to gain them a playoff spot, it wasn't enough to win the NFC Central where the Purple People Beaters from Minnesota were the ultimate in defense. The Vikings allowed only 143 points. Their 12 and two record was the best in the NFL thanks to a defense which scored almost as much as the offense. While the NFC Central was the stronghold of crunch and crush in 1970, there were sounds of thunder heard throughout the league. <laughs> men of the AFC West resided in Oakland. Chief Wizard, 43-year-old George Blanda. The Raiders were unbeaten in their division as against San Diego, Blanda kicked the winning field goal with four seconds remaining. Exit Chargers. The Denver Broncos with a hard-nosed defense and a good offense won their first three and led the division. Then they met the Raiders and went home victims of shell shock. In Denver, it was George again, when with time almost gone and Oakland trailing, he threw for the winning touchdown. Exit Broncos. And it was the perils of George Blanda again when Oakland trailed the Browns with less than a minute. His pass tied it at 20. His 52-yard field goal cleared the posts with only three seconds remaining. Oakland 23, Cleveland 20. Against the Jets, the Raiders trailed with one second left when on fourth down, a new cast of Darrell LaMonica to Warren Wells pulled off the greatest of the Raider miracles. And while everyone Oakland met suffered defeat in unbelievable ways, perhaps the Chiefs lost most. They started 1970 as world champions and even led Oakland in their first meeting. But with three seconds to go, George Blanda, who else, 
kicked a 48-yarder to give the Raiders a tie that amounted to a moral victory. And when the two teams met in the game that decided the AFC West title, the Chiefs played as if they knew they were doomed. Exit Chiefs. Enter Oakland, the miracle working division champions. In the first playoff game, the Raiders faced Miami and relied on their oldest weapon, the bomb. They downed the Dolphins 21 to 14 and headed for the AFC championship. In New Orleans, the Saints lived up to their name and performed one merit. Tom Dempsey will try to kick the longest field goal in National League history. They're sending him on with two seconds left. Scarpetti will hold. Dempsey will have to kick one 62 yards to win the ball game. Holy daylight, I've seen them all, but this is the most exciting moment in Saint history. Here's a snap, the ball is down. Dempsey kicks, it's on the way. In Los Angeles, the Rams were older, but seemingly tougher. Their defense humbled most opponents, but couldn't contend with the NFL's Cinderella team, San Francisco. After falling under the 49ers' spell, the Rams lost momentum and found one obstacle insurmountable. For in San Francisco, there was a John Brody, a Gene Washington, and a team that found the glass slipper comfortable. For the 49ers, it was their first championship shot, and they cast a wary eye at the thought of losing it. Everyone seemed to try a little harder. year they were tough, but never any tougher than when in a frigid playoff game with the Vikings in Minnesota, they came away with a 17-14 victory. The 49ers then picked up their coach and packed for home and the NFC Championship. In Washington, the Redskins had a runner named Larry Brown. And although he couldn't lead them to a winning season, he himself was a winner as he became the NFL's leading rusher with 1,125 yards. St. Louis had MacArthur Lane, and behind his powerful style, the Cardinals led in the NFC East.
The Cards' defense was also strong with three consecutive shutouts, including a 38 to nothing route of Dallas. But St. Louis didn't win the title because they couldn't beat the Giants. Twice, New York walloped the Cardinals. The Giants themselves had a shot at the title behind the flashing blue shoes of Ron Johnson, who became the first Giant ever to rush for over a thousand yards in a season. Despite Johnson, the Giants weren't able to withstand the late season charge of the Cowboys. In the early going, Dallas was crushed by the Vikings, 54 to 13. They were trampled by St. Louis, 38 to nothing. They had been rated as favorites, but had taken a ride on the chute to nowhere. Then came the light, and Doomsday was everywhere. Coach Tom Landry revamped his offense, and Bob Hayes became the man to catch. Cowboys had yet another prize, and running back Dwayne Thomas gave them a double-barreled offense. And with a great closing spurt, the Cowboys shot right into the playoff picture by winning the NFC East title. Against the Lions, Dallas scored only five points. In the end, five points was all they needed for their defense held Detroit scoreless. Now Dallas was in the NFC Championship at San Francisco. And finally, the Cowboys proved they could win the big one. They powered over the 49ers, became NFC champions, and headed for Miami and Super Bowl V. In Boston, it used to be fun being a quarterback. But then came tough Joe Cap from Minnesota and he changed all that. Win or die trying was his vow. Boston's two and 12 record shows which part of the vow he kept. Which leaves one question. Why would anyone want to be a quarterback in Boston? Perhaps Jim Plunkett knows. In Buffalo, rookie Dennis Shaw became the 13th quarterback in two years, and he was superb. He finished third in the conference in passing.
But above all, he was one cool rookie. In 1970, Dennis Shaw proved that, barring injury, Buffalo's quarterback problems are over. In New York, the Jets couldn't bar injury. And of all people, it was Joe Namath who was out for the year with a broken wrist. And so came untested Al Woodall to show what he could do. And he did all right as he led his team to big upsets over the Rams and the Vikings and save the Jets a third place finish. In Miami, new coach Don Shula had Bob Greasy, the scrambling man extraordinary. With Paul Warfield hauling them in, Greasy passed the Dolphins into contention for the title. He could afford to smile. But then his scrambling caught up with him. The Dolphins lost three straight. The smiles were gone. But Bob Greasy came back and led the Dolphins to a 10 and 4 record and a playoff spot, which wasn't bad for a young expansion team. In Baltimore, they had it all a new but knowledgeable coach in Don McCafferty and a rock of Gibraltar defense that broke other teams under a withering rush. But above all else, in Baltimore, they had number 19, John Unitas. And he led the Colts to an 11-2 and 1 record. They won their division going away. In the first playoff game against the Bengals, they had little trouble and won 17 to nothing. Against the Raiders in the AFC Championship, they had a tougher time, but won 27 to 17. And for the Colts, the next stop was Miami and Super Bowl V against Dallas. Both teams had things to prove, and both played a tough game. The winner in the 1970 season's championship was still in doubt with only nine seconds remaining. And then rookie Jim O'Brien's field goal put an end to 1970. The Baltimore Colts were world champions. And as the final nine seconds clicked off, you fans all over the country looked back on the spectacle that had been 1970. There had been excitement and thrills, incredible plays and unexpected successes. You'd seen the beginnings of new stars and the fading of old ones. You'd seen expansion teams grow up and new rivalries flourish. You'd seen triumph and defeat. You'd seen the vast spectrum of the elements of professional football come together in a perfect rainbow blend to make 1970 the greatest year ever. And years from now, when the conversation drifts to football, you'll look back and you'll say to yourself, Yes, I remember 1970, 
And if ever there was one, 1970 was that one vintage year. I suppose you get two tickets that's under the name of Danny Abramovich for Bill Orth. Oh, okay, there you are. Oh, jump, uh, hoosie feed. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You got any left at all? No, sir. No standing room? Nothing no, room? sir, we don't sell standing room. <laughs> it's sold out. I'm supposed to have some tickets here. What's the name, sir? Flowers. Ron Flowers. From one of the teams? The quarterback of Dallas was supposed to have called down here and got me a couple seats. Well, we didn't have any tickets to give him, because we didn't have any to sell. Not a week ago or 10 days no, ago? No, sir, we sure didn't. Super Bowl's been sold out for two months. Hello. I wonder if you have two tickets here, please. My name is Mason. Mason? Yeah, they were left by Jack Newman. No, sir. No, not yet. I'll have to check. No, Mason. No tickets? No, sir. Oh, would you check again? I'm sure they were left here. They were left no. by Mr. Newman. From a team? Huh? From a no, team? No, he's with the office. He's with the league office. No, I don't oh, have sure any. Oh, because I just talked to him this morning. I'm sorry. He hasn't come yet. Could you just look through the box one I more time? I did look. Well, could you check again? I'm sure they're here. I did. I have no Newman. Oh, there's got to be. It must be some mistake. Could you look maybe in the office or somewhere? They're all out here in this box. Well, it's impossible. I mean, I came all the way down from New York for the game. Well, you'll have to wait for the gentleman to leave them, to bring well, them. He told me he left them already. I already talked to him. I called him from the hotel. Well, you'll have to call him back. Oh, this is impossible. I came all the way down here for this game. I'm sorry, sir. Well, can I have your name, please? Because there's going to have to be something done about this. Ella May. I'm sorry? Ella May. Ella May? Mm -hmm. Now, what's your last name? Weatherwax. Miss Weatherwax? Because mm -hmm. I'm going to have to check into this. Mrs. I hope Weatherwax. You Mrs. Weatherwax? Yes. All right, this is just inexcusable. I don't know how you can run an office like this. Well, we do a pretty good job. Okay, Weatherwax, thank you. Take a blimp ride. Super Sunday, 1971. A bright day of promise for an extraordinary game of pro football. Early in the first quarter, the fickle nature of Super Bowl V began to emerge. 
Baltimore's Ron Gardeen misplayed a punt, and Dallas recovered on the Colt nine. to reach the end zone failed and the Cowboys had to settle for a field goal. We gotta have it like we need it. Mike Clark's kick gave Dallas a three-point lead but it was a disappointing end to an early opportunity. Well I think we ought to just go with our regular stuff and blow them out of there. They're playing a little strong toward Pettis I think. The next time the Cowboys had the ball coach Tom Landry instructed his quarterback Craig Morton to concentrate on the running game. Twisting through the Colts like two Texas tornadoes, Walt Garrison, number 32, and Dwayne Thomas, number 33, proved the worth of Landry's tactics. Only once did Morton resort to that old and honored cowboy trademark, the long pass to Bob Hayes. Hayes' catch brought Dallas to the Baltimore Six, but for the second time, Landry's offense was stopped by Don McCafferty's defense. On third down, a hard rush by Billy Ray Smith, number 74, forced a desperate pass from Morton. The pass was incomplete, but even worse was the fact that Morton was called for intentional grounding, and Dallas was penalized 15 yards. The longest march of the game was shrouded in failure. The Cowboys had to settle for a field goal and again came away with three points instead of seven. Once in a great while, the clouds of chance will overshadow the plans of men. Such was the case in Super Bowl V when John Unitas dropped back to throw early in the second quarter. His pass bounced off the intended receiver, Ed Hinton, then was tipped by the Cowboys' Mel Renfro, and then caught by the Colts' John Mackey, who raced 75 yards to a touchdown. Cowboys protested the play, claiming Renfro never touched the ball. If he had not touched it, the score would have been nullified. Passes can't be tipped from one offensive man to another unless a defender touches the ball in between. As the play is repeated from two different angles, watch the spin of the football accelerate when Renfro's fingers graze the laces.
Unitas' touchdown pass evened the score, but it was his last look at the sun before the coming storm. The extra point attempt was blocked, and the next time Unitas took the field, Dallas made him pay dearly for his quick glimpse of glory. Third down, Unitas escaped from his disintegrating passing pocket, only to be met by linebacker Leroy Jordan, whose perfect shoulder tackle jarred the ball loose, and Jethro Pugh recovered on the Colt 28. Craig Morton moved the Cowboys to a touchdown with three quick passes to his running backs. Dwayne Thomas, number 33, and Dan Reeves, number 30. of the second half, the Cowboys gained a foothold and threatened to break open the game. A jolting tackle forced a fumble. Dallas recovered and marched to the Colt two-yard line. Put it away, baby! Put it away! Let's go! It was another opportunity for the Cowboys, but again, their hopes were shattered on the rocks of the Colt defense. Dwayne Thomas was hit hard at the goal line, fumbled the ball, and Baltimore recovered. It was a big play for the Colts. A touchdown might have clinched the game for Dallas, but instead the recovered fumble made a new beginning for Baltimore. This trial by fire stoked every heart, and for the first time in the game, the Colt offense seized the initiative. <laughs> Earl Morrill replaced the injured John Unitas at quarterback and brought with him a hard-born determination to succeed where he once had failed. In 1968, Morrill led the Colts to Super Bowl III. And when he crumbled beneath the charge of the New York Jets, he was called a sunshine soldier. But today, he was a sturdy commander 
and his experienced arm was the only consistent element in the Colt attack. Twice in the fourth period, Morrill moved Baltimore into scoring positions, but both times the Cowboy defense denied the Colts a touchdown. Chuck Howley ended one drive with an interception in the end zone. The other drive ended with the most unusual play of the afternoon. Morrill handed to Sam Haverlack, who completed a pass to Hinton. Cornell Green ripped the ball loose, but neither team could recover it before it rolled out of the end zone. The officials ruled the play a touchback and awarded the Cowboys the ball on their own 20. Another look reveals the extemporaneous quality of this play. Haverlack was supposed to pass the ball back to Morrow, but Jethro Pugh, number 75, disrupted the pattern. Haverlack threw instead for John Mackey, but Ed Hinton caught it. When Cornell Green swiped the ball from Hinton's hands, neither team could recover it. Out of this offensive failure came a renewed determination on the part of the Colt defense. The emphasis was on the job ahead, not on the wreckage that lay behind. A pass intended for Walt Garrison was deflected into the hands of the Colt safety, Rick Volk. The real cause of the interception was the high-handed rush of number 85, Roy Hilton, who forced Morton to make an inaccurate throw. Volk carried the ball to the Dallas three. Tom Nowatzki powered into the end zone, and Super Bowl V was a tie game. Once in a great while, the drama of an entire season narrows to a very small focus. To the final plays of the final game. With seven and one half minutes remaining, the two survivors of the most competitive season in NFL history stood toe-to-toe -to -toe and slugged it out in a fight to the finish. Come on, up, right, up, Let's go! Watch your roll, up. Watch your roll, up. Work like a charm. Let's go, Let's go, Dwayne. Go, Dwayne. Go, Dwayne. All right, Dwayne. All right, Dwayne. That's 
and living in its last seconds ignites the spirit of the true champion. but steadily. The Cowboys began to weaken under the ever-tightening grip of the Colt defense. The Cowboys did not break under the pressure, but they bent. A pass from Craig Morton bounced off the fingertips of Dan Reeves and was intercepted by Mike Curtis. Once again, and for the last time, the relentless Colt defense shaped the character of Super Bowl V. Curtis returned the ball to the Dallas 28 and put the Colts in range of a field goal. Tell them all not to set until you tell them to set. And if they overload one side, give a man over right or man over left. Nobody get set till I holler set. Now tell them all when you come in. Let the fullback. You got to tell the lineman there. You got to hold. Jerry, let Jerry set. Tell him in the hole. All right. Nobody got got to hold him on the set now. Right. Just to make sure Bubba gets it now. Make sure he's on the set. You got to hold. You got to hold. Like kidding, like popping. We're gonna win this game. The World Championship of Professional Football would be settled in one final play. Come on. Come on, baby. Come on. Please, please, please. All the money, all the glory, and all that counts in pro football rode on the right foot of rookie Jim O'Brien.
This NFL Films production has been brought to you by the National Football League. The NFL is online at www.nfl.com.